thanks everyone for coming. Um, and thank you all for sort of paying attention. There's no way I'm going to be able to compete with the last talk. There are no robots or anything like this in this one. It's just a, a bit of fairly simple maths, OK? Um, and so whenever anyone asks me what it is that mathematicians do, I always tell them it's basically just solving puzzles. Uh, so when I was asked to do this, I immediately thought of my favorite uh, Christmas carol, which is the 12 days of Christmas, because there's quite a lot of sort of puzzles and interesting mathematics inside it, right? Uh, so I'm sure all of you know it. Uh, I'm not going to sing it to you, don't worry. Um, so the idea is on the first day you get, you know, a partridge in a pear tree, so you get one gift. On the second day you get that and um, two, what's it, two turtle doves and so on and so on. So each first day you get one, then one plus two, then one plus two plus three, and, and it carries on like this. So if you're interested in mathematics, there's a lot of questions you can ask about this, right? So on the, on the 12th day, you end up with a whole long list of things, right? 12 plus 11 plus 10 and so on. Uh, so naturally, the natural question, I guess, if, if, if you're of this sort of, this, uh, this nature, what you would ask is, so how many gifts you get each day? This is a very natural, very obvious question, okay? And what you can do is, well, okay, I can, if there's only 12 days, so I can sit and I can count and I can work out how much there is each day, that's easy. Well, what if this continued, right? What if this pattern continued and I went, instead of 12 days, there was 100 days building up to Christmas or 1,000 days or, you know, any number of days. How could I efficiently and quickly count how many gifts I would get each day? And so this leads on to the second one. So how many gifts would I get on the 100th day or the 1,000th day or the nth day? So by, by this I mean, can we write down a formula that can that we can use to easily determine how many gifts we'd get. So some of you probably have already seen this and probably already know the answer to this. But this leads on to some, some more interesting questions as well. Um, you could also ask, well, you could say it doesn't matter how many gifts I get each day. The only thing that matters is how many I, I get altogether. And this is another interesting question to ask. And again, you could ask the same series of questions. Well, what if this pattern continued? How many would I get altogether? What, what would be my running tally, right? Um, although when I first heard this, the most pressing question I had was sort of, what, what on earth is a turtle dove? Uh, presumably, it looks something like this. So with, with that settled, we can sort of focus on the more mathematical questions. So let's try and answer the, the first question, okay? And we're going to do this systematically. So it's going to be fairly gentle at the beginning. So on the first day, I get just one gift. All right, that's easy. We can all do this. On the second day, I get my one. And then... I get another two, so I get three altogether. On the third day, I get my three plus another three, so I get six altogether. And so this pattern continues. So on the fourth day, I end up with 10. And so you can see that these can be arranged into sort of quite nice, this, they have a nice geometry about them, these numbers, right? I can arrange them into these nice, neat equilateral triangles. So uh, out of interest, does anyone know what this sequence of numbers is called? Yeah? Sorry? Not quite Pascal's triangle, but you're not far off, yeah? Yes, these are the triangular numbers, exactly, right? So they're triangular numbers because I can arrange them in these, in these nice equilateral triangles, right? So uh, we've got these triangular numbers. So these are the first few triangular numbers in case you're, you're wondering. So each one, each time you go up one, you add an extra, an extra uh, N. Okay, so can I count these? The, the task is to count these, and I need an efficient way to count these. So we just got to think about this nice geometry, right? This, this way of arranging them. So I'm going to arrange them in a slightly different way and just make this slight observation that if I take the same number of triangular number, the same number of gifts each day and stick it on top, I can get something quite convenient. So, okay, day one is easy, but if I put another one on top, I make it into a one by two rectangle. On day two, I get my three, but if I stick another three on top, I can make it into a two by three rectangle. Day three, I can do the same. I take my six, I stick another six on top, I get a three by four rectangle. So notice I'm creating a rectangle, and each time the number of gifts up the side is one more than the number of gifts up the bottom, right? Along the bottom, rather. And I can do the same for day four. And I can continue this. Right, so this is a useful thing to do, because th these are so easy to count now, right? It, it, the, it's so much easier to count things arranged in rectangles than it is to count things arranged, you know, in triangles or anything like this. And we can all do this. For the first one, I'll just do, you know, one by two and then half it to get the actual number of presents, then two by three and half it, and so on, and so on. So all I have to do is multiply, and the, the number of gifts along the bottom is always just the day, right? So, okay, 
this makes life much easier for us. So what would the nth triangular number be? Can anyone tell me what the formula for the nth triangular number will have to be? Yeah? Brilliant, absolutely perfect. So for those that didn't hear that, he said n times n plus one over two, right? N is the day, so that's how many gifts along the bottom. N plus one is the gifts along the sides. You multiply them, then you half it to get the actual number of gifts, all right? So this clever way of just rearranging them has made things much easier. All right, so we have a formula. So now, you know, the acid test is, can we actually use this to get something that we couldn't get easily? So how many gifts would I have to get, would I get on my 100th day then? Can, can anyone figure this out? So if you guys can do this in the next few seconds, you're better than me, I'll tell you this, because I, I couldn't do it, yes? Brilliant, okay, so future mathematician there. Yes, certainly, it's, it's 5,050, excellent. So it's 100 times 101, which is 10,100, and then you half it to get 5,050, so well done. Okay, so we've got a technique for counting the number of gifts on any given day. So in a sense, we've solved that problem. But actually, you could sort of uh, think, well, and as mathematicians like to do, you could try and sort of generalize this and create new puzzles for yourself. So you could say, okay, well, that may be an easy sequence. I'm just going one, one plus two, one plus two plus three. Maybe that's just a bit too easy. Can I modify this to create something a little bit more interesting or to get any other behavior? Okay, well, there's lots of directions that you could go with this, right? But let's say, for example, instead of one plus two plus three and so on, I did one, then one plus three, then one plus three plus five, so I'm only adding the odd numbers, okay? What will happen if I only just add the odd numbers? What will I end up with? Well, okay, so in other words, what if my true love only wished to give me an odd number of each gift, right? So what would this look like? Day one, we'd still just have our one gift. Day two, we'd have one plus three. Day three, we'd have one, uh, the, th the four from yesterday plus another five, and so on. So on day four, we add another seven to this. So although I've arranged these into triangles, these are not triangular numbers because these triangles are not equilateral triangles, okay? They're sort of a bit too fat at the base and a bit too short to be, to be triangular numbers, all right? So they're not triangular numbers. So is there a nice way I can think to count these? And it turns out, yes. Again, just by trying to think about the geometry, can I just arrange them in another way wh whereby it's easy for me to count them? So let's do the same thing. So I start with my one gift. Then on day two, I have one. This time, I'm going to take the additional three, and I'm just going to put them around. Then I take the four that I had yesterday, and I add five, but I just put them around the edge. And I can do the same thing again. And I can keep going and doing this. So again, all I've done is rearrange them, but now this is much easier to count, right? Because I get perfect squares. These numbers I can arrange in perfect squares. So, of course, okay, I'm sure anyone could tell me what, how many there are. There's one, then four, two squared, then three squared, which is nine, four squared, 16, and so on. So I've ended up with the square numbers. Uh, and so let's just think about this for a second. We've just shown in a very, just with a few pictures, that if I take the first n odd numbers and I add them together, I end up with the n squared, right? So I, that's an interesting fact in and of itself. Um, and it's quite nice as to how easily we got there. So okay, so as I said, these are the square numbers. And of course, no marks for guessing the formula is n squared. Okay, so let's review what we've done. So mathematicians, as I said, love to generalize things, so let's try and generalize this and try and ask some more interesting questions. Um, okay, so what have we done? We, first of all, we started with a sequence of numbers that could be arranged in these nice equilateral triangles. So these were our triangular numbers, and we found a formula for them. Then we took a sequence of numbers that could be arranged into perfect squares. These were our square numbers, and we found a formula for them. So could anyone think, where am I gonna go next with this? Where, where, how might I choose to generalize this? Any ideas? So after triangles and then squares, the natural thing to go to is pentagons. I'll try and arrange it into a nice pentagon, right? Okay, so I can arrange these into a nice neat pentagon and make a larger pentagon and, and larger ones still and so on. So numbers that can be arranged like this, we call them pentagonal numbers. And okay, very quickly you realize there's nothing really special about three, four, or five. I can do this with any number of sides. I can construct 
hexagonal numbers or heptagonal or any, any other number of sides. So I can construct any sort of polygon I like. And these numbers, we give them a special name because of this nice geometric property. We call these polygonal numbers. So numbers which can be arranged into these regular polygons are the polygonal numbers. Triangular numbers are examples of polygonal numbers. Square numbers are examples of polygonal numbers, and so on. OK, so these, these numbers have a sort of a long history, actually, in mathematics. They were studied quite some time ago. The first real systematic study was way back in ancient Greece by a Greek mathematician uh, called Hypsicles of Alexandria, around 150 BC, although we think that actually People even before this knew a little bit about these, these numbers and their properties, so like the Pythagoreans and stuff. OK, so let's just fix a little bit of notation. I'm hoping this doesn't confuse anyone. Um, we're going to call a number that can be arranged into a regular polygon with s sides and s gonal numbers. So three gonal is our triangular numbers, four gonal is our square numbers, and so on. This is just a convenient piece of terminology when we're talking about polygonal numbers where the number of sides is unspecified, right? So this is just a handy piece of terminology. So, okay, for the triangular numbers, we were able to come up with a formula. For the square numbers, we were able to come up with a nice formula. So, for, the, for any s, can we come up with a formula? So, this is an interesting question. Can you do it for any s, or is, it, or is somehow 3 and 4 special, right? Now, it turns out we can. Does anyone know what this formula is, by the way, that I'm about to show you? I mean, don't feel too bad if you don't, because I didn't know it until I looked it up a couple of days ago, so uh, it's, it's not so obvious. But this is the, the formula. So we can do it for any s at all, right? We can construct a formula to work out the nth polygonal number for any number of sites. So, OK, again, let's test this with an example. So what is the eighth hexagonal number going to be? So, OK, hexagonal number, so the sides is 6. So I have 4 times 8 times 7 divided by 2. So 8 times 7 is 56. Divide that by 2, you get 28. Multiply that by 4, you get 112. And then you add on 8, so that gives you 120. And if anyone wishes to actually check and count these things, you can verify this. But th so this actually works. OK, so can someone tell me what the fourth heptagonal number is? So heptagonal meaning seven-sided, right? Heptagon has seven sides. So can anyone work this out using that formula? Yeah? Not quite. It's a little less than 50. So if s is 7, so you have 5 times 4 times 3 divided by 2, and then you add on another 4. Yep? Yeah? Absolutely right. So the answer is 34. Well done. Excellent. Um, so this, this formula does genuinely work. And again, you can verify this if you wish to put some dots into a, into a heptagon and count how many dots there are, OK? So, OK, we've got this. So now that we've, we've got a formula for all of these, and OK, you, this is moderately amusing so far, and we've done some interesting calculations, we can start to ask some deeper questions. So how are these related to other integers? So this is, by the way, a general theme in mathematics, right? So you understand the special case, and then you want to know how this case is related to more, a more general concept, right? So how can we take the special class of nice integers that have these nice geometric properties and use them to construct um, other numbers? So OK, this is a very vague question. So let's start by thinking just about the triangular numbers. So these are my first few triangular numbers. Now let me take any number which is not triangular. I'm going to choose some numbers at random. Uh, so let's take 17. So I can observe that I can write this as the sum of some, I can build it up out of triangular numbers. And I don't need very many. I only need three of them, right? So I can write 17 as 10 plus 6 plus 1. Or I could have written it as 15 plus 1 plus 1. But the point is, I can do it very quickly w out of triangular numbers. OK. What about 29? Can I make this up out of triangular numbers? Can anyone see how I could make this up out of triangular numbers? Yeah? Sorry? Absolutely right. 10 plus 10 plus 6 plus 3. Can I do it in a shorter way? Can I use less triangular numbers? What if I want to use as few as possible? Yeah. 28 and 1. That's, that's very good. Absolutely right. So I, I, that's the one I had. But you can, there's other ways. It's not unique. But yes, 28 plus 1, for example. Um, OK, 54. This one may be slightly more challenging. Can anyone construct this as a sum of triangular numbers? Sorry, yes at the back. 
So I really didn't hear that. So if anyone could just shout it forward. 45 plus 6 plus 3, excellent, yeah. That's quite right, that's exactly what I had. So yeah, good job. So notice, we only need three. You can make it up out of very few. So the next question is, well, is, all right, I've chosen these numbers fairly randomly, but is, have I just chosen quite nice numbers, right? And you could think, well, suppose I choose a very large number. Now the gaps between these triangular numbers as the sequence goes on gets bigger and bigger, right? The gap between the 99th one and the 100th one is 100. The gap between the 900th 99th one and the 1,000th one is 1,000 and so on. So the gaps get bigger, they get very spaced out. So if I want to construct a very large number, you'd think I'd need, okay, a large tri some large triangular numbers, but to make up the gaps, I'd need a lot of smaller ones. So you may think I need lots of triangular numbers if I want to build uh, large integers, right? So it turns out, actually, that three suffices. I could make any integer as a sum of at most three triangular numbers. This is a really remarkable theorem, uh, and I really hope you kind of appreciate why this is such a nice theorem. This, so you would never really expect this to be true, but actually you can build any integer out of just three triangular numbers. Um, and so the content of this, by the way, is in at most three. You can always build anything out of triangular numbers because one is a triangular number, so you could always do one plus one plus one plus one. But the fact that you get enough precision with only three is pretty remarkable as a fact. And so this was proved um, by Carl Friedrich Gauss. Sorry, that picture's not so great. I don't think anyone can really see that. But so this was proved back in 1796. And so Gauss, by the way, is generally considered by most mathematicians to be probably the, possibly the greatest or certainly one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. Um, and he was very pleased when he proved this. So you can't really see this at the bottom. I had to add this. This is a little snippet from his notebook where he actually wrote this theorem for the first time. And it's got the word eureka written in Latin next to the statement of the theorem in slightly strange notation. So he was clearly very pleased with himself when he proved it. And rightly so, it's a wonderful theorem. Okay, so we, we can say something about the triangular numbers. What about square numbers? So can we say something similar for square numbers? Again, let's take the same numbers. Can I write 17 as a sum of square numbers? Absolutely right, so good. All of you guys are shouting back to me, 16 plus one. I've got nine plus four plus four, so you've done better than me. You've done it in fewer, fewer square numbers than I did. Um, 29, similarly, I can write as 25 plus four. What about 54? How can I build 54 out of square numbers? So anyone got an answer for me? Anyone able to do it yet? Yes? Sorry, yeah. 49, 4, and 1. Absolutely right. That's exactly what I got. So, okay, it looks like exactly the same thing is true for these square numbers. I can write any square number so far that I've picked as a sum of, um, of three square numbers, right? So you could say, well, okay, maybe I, exactly the same theorem holds. But then it doesn't take very long to look a little bit further. So 23 um, can be written as 9 plus 4, 9 plus 9 plus 4 plus 1. And this is unique. 23 has a special property in that there's only one way to write it as a sum of squares. So it cannot be written as a sum of three square numbers. It can only be written as the sum of four square numbers. So okay, is four enough or do we need more is the, is the point. So it turns out that actually four suffices for square numbers. So every positive integer is the sum of at most four square numbers. So I needed three triangle numbers and four square numbers. So this theorem was actually proved by a great French mathematician uh, called Joseph Lagrange in 1770. So by the way, just note that this actually predated the last theorem by about roughly 30 years. So this came first and um, then the theorem for triangular numbers came afterwards, okay? So this was the first one to be proved. And we usually call this Lagrange's four square theorem. And this is really a cornerstone of number theory. Um, so this is a really, again, a really important theorem in mathematics. Okay, so we saw that we needed three square number, three triangular numbers to build every um, positive integer. And we saw that we needed four square numbers. What about general polygonal numbers? Where am I gonna go with this, yes? So at most five for uh, what's it, the pentagonal numbers, yeah? And how many hexagonal numbers am I gonna need? Six, okay, so that's, that's a good suggestion. So let's, let's see how this works out. 
So this was actually the same suggestion by this mathematician, Pierre de Fermat, who suggested this back in 1638, long before the square, four square theorem was proved, and long before the um, Eureka theorem of Gauss was proved. Okay, so he suggested that precisely what you've suggested, so that's a very good observation. He said, you need at most s, s gonal numbers. And so he conjectured this in the way that he conjectured everything, which is he claimed he'd proved it, but no one ever saw a proof. And so it was nearly 200 years until the mathematician Cauchy ended up proving this. So he, it was quite some time before this was eventually proved by the, a really great mathematician, Cauchy. Okay, so we started off just trying to count gifts and we've ended up with some quite deep mathematical theorems. And this again is a really spectacular theorem. Uh, so I really hope you sort of see why this is such a, such a nice theorem. Okay, let's go back to one of the other puzzles and this will be fairly brief just to end. How many gifts am I gonna get in total? So this was another question that we asked before. Well, okay, let's try and create a running tab and see how many gifts we end up with. So on day one, I get one gift. On day two, I get my one, but I have another three, right? It's a triangular number. Day three, I have the four I had before plus another six, another triangular number, which I'm just gonna put underneath, and so on. So actually, we notice that if I take a running tab, what I can do is I can arrange this into a nice tetrahedron, right? This is a regular tetrahedron. So whereas before we were arranging things as polygons, you know, two-dimensional, we've got now polyhedra in three dimensions. Okay, we can ask some of the same questions about these. So these, we call them, of course, tetrahedral numbers for the same reason. And we also have a formula for these. We have a nice formula, which is n times n plus one times n plus two over six. So we can use this to determine how many gifts we get altogether. So I won't ask you to do this quickly. Does anyone know the answer off the top of their heads? How many gifts you'd end up with altogether? I mean, don't worry, this is not that easy a calculation. You plug in 12 into that and it turns out you get um, 364 gifts. So you get one gift for every day of the year but Christmas Day. Okay, so we can ask some similar questions about these tetrahedral numbers and so this is sort of an interesting case. There was a, a politician and a lawyer, actually, predominantly a politician and a lawyer, who had a very keen interest in mathematics. So he actually wrote a few maths papers and made some important contributions, despite not being a professional mathematician. And so he suggested in 1850 that every positive integer is the sum of at most five tetrahedral numbers. This is what he suggested. So okay, I'm gonna ask you to sort of be brave and be bold and pick a side. So if you think that Pollock was correct, and every positive integer is the sum of at most five tetrahedral numbers. Put your hand up. Okay, about only a few. If you think he's wrong, put your hand up. Okay, so most people think he's wrong. Well, the answer is, we don't know. This is still an open problem. So some of the brightest mathematicians have thought about this, and no one has come up with a proof, and no one has been able to produce a counterexample. So if anything I said was even remotely interesting to you, then you can maybe start thinking about this and start thinking about uh, some mathematics and developing your mathematics. And maybe in a few years time, one of you will come back and tell me the answer to this question and I would really be delighted to hear it. So I guess I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening.